Again, uh, our second week in our journey through the book of the Revelation. No S on it, Revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we have but one Jesus and one revelation of Jesus. This marvelous book called the book of the Revelation. We learned last week it is the only prophetic book, the New Testament. It's the only book written in chronological order in the Bible of order of events. We learned that Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19, I believe, is the key to it, uh, that John was to write the things which he had seen, past tense. And what did he see? He saw the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his majesty and glory in chapter 1 as he gave us a picture of Jesus. If anybody knew what Jesus looked like, it would be John. John saw him as a lowly carpenter as a humble rabbi and preacher and master and teacher. John saw him as a man that came and had nothing. The Bible said he had not even a place to lay his head or a pillow to lay it on. John spent three and a half years with him approximately. He knew the Lord. John was the one that laid his head on Jesus' bosom. So if anybody knew what Jesus looked like, it would be John. But when we get to Revelation, he sees a whole different Jesus. No more a lonely carpenter. No more just a rabbi, a teacher of the, the Jewish faith. He see, no longer does he even see him as a lamb before the slaughter. Because John was at the crucifixion with Mary that day. But John sees him now in all of his glory. All of his majesty, his majesticness. And gave us a beautiful picture of our, of our Lord. Then Jesus said, now I want you to write, John, the things which are present tense, which is the church age, the age of grace in which we live in. John was to write a letter dictated by the Lord. Matter of fact, seven personal letters written to seven personal pastors, to seven literal churches that existed in John's day. They're in modern day Turkey today, which was Asia Minor back then. And all seven of these churches existed. Matter of fact, John even pastored one of them, the first church. And he said, I want you to write, John, and Jesus dictates a personal letter to each one of these pa pastors. Polycarp was the, happened to be the pastor of the church of Smyrna, the first martyr who gave his life for Christ. And so John did. And then he says, now, John, I want you to write the things which are going to be here after. After the church age. After the age of the church. You're going to write the things that are going to be future tense. What's to come. And of course, chapter 4 starts off with, come up hither. So what did John see? He saw the church in heaven. Because he wrote about them in chapters 2 and 3, but in chapter 4, he sees them raptured out in, the, in heaven in glory. And then he goes on to write about the tribulation hour from chapter 6 all the way through 19, verse 11. We see what all takes place during the trib of seven years. And by the way, from chapter 6 through 19, 11, never once is the church ever mentioned. Never is the word ecclesia, the called out assembly, ever mentioned, never talked about. Now church, certainly church, think about it with me for just a moment. If they were there and present, don't you think John would have wrote about it? I don't think as split as this book is and as thorough as this and in full detail that Revelation is that John would have left the church out had it been there. But it was not. And we thank God for that. So we're rolling along and we've got our, I trust, our spiritual virtuality goggles on this morning as we're sitting in our seats here and we're going to take a virtual tour of chapters 2 and chapter 3. We're going to look at these seven letters that were written to seven pastors of seven churches. Now, we're not going to take each letter of each church and everything it said because we would have to take each church each week for about four to five weeks on each church. And you can see for the next 35 weeks, we would still be studying chapters two and three. So we're not going to do that. We're doing an overall view. 
They, they, all, th all seven of them had three things at least in common. One, they had a letter that Jesus, the first thing he did is he recognized their works. He said, I know your works. And he goes to explain a little bit about each of their works that he saw these churches doing. Then five out of the seven, he has a condemnation. He says, nevertheless, though, I have somewhat against you. And he begins to tell what he has. Two of the churches did not get a condemnation against them. That was the church of Smyrna, the martyred church. And nor did the church of Philadelphia, the great missions church. He had nothing but good to say about them and those two. And so all that is in common. And then he talked a little bit about their works. He talked a little bit about what he had against them. And he, he spelled it out, told what it was. We know that through the time that each one of these churches represent a time period of history. You say, well, how do we know that? Because if we go back and study history, and the historian writers of the early church, which is Plato and Josephus and all of these, and on down the line as we moved on through the centuries, you can take whatever Jesus said exactly about that church, the works as well as what he had against them, and check it out with the time period of history that that church would represent, and it matches perfect. And so that's why we know that it represents eat. I want you to also notice as we look at this, there were only seven churches and there were only seven letters. There is not eight churches, nor nine, nor is there seven or eight or not eight or nine letters. Seven being the number of perfection, the number of completion in Scripture. So the seventh church and the seventh letters was to the last church of the church age, the age of grace, and would come to an end. Then we move into chapter 4 and get raptured out. Amen. Amen. The Laodicean church started in 1900. In the 1800s was the Church of Philadelphia, the great missions church. Missionary Carney started the great mission movement. And there was a great move of missionaries and revivals and, a, and an outpouring of God's Spirit and a harvest of souls during the church of Philadelphia. And, of course, he's the one that Jesus said, I promise you, I will keep you out of the tribulation hour. The word ek means out from, not go through. Not persevere through, but I will keep you out of, snatch you out of. And we got snatched out in chapter 4. So we're going to look at these churches this morning, and as we study this this morning, and these letters, seven letters to the seven churches. And the thing I want to do is, again, that he, when he closed out every letter, he started out every letter, I know your works. He commend them for some of their works. Then five of them, he said, but I've got something against you. And he said what it was. And then he closes each letter out. He's kind of like Paul with all of his letters. He says, to him that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit hath to say to the churches. So Jesus made sure each church was going to get it. He said, to him that overcometh, I will give. And in here we have some 19 overcoming rewards to the overcomer. That's the application, you see. We can hear the Word of God. We can heed to the Word of God. We can study the works and uh, the non-works and the, the commendations and the condemnations that were given. But every letter, all seven of them, closed out with the same. Jesus said to him that overcometh. That's a present participle, by the way, which means continually repeated. Overcoming the world, the ways of the world, the things of the world, the system of the world. The evil system of the, and all of that. He said, I have some special things for you. About 19 of them total that are given out there. Some churches have one, some had two, some had three of each one of them. So we want to look at that this morning, the overcomer's reward. I'm going to look at more of the positive side of this, the pleasant side as we take a journey through these churches. I've given you an overall view, and we'll look at that in just a minute, but uh, right now we need to pray and ask for God's help, okay? Amen. <laughs> Father, truly we do humble before you this morning. And Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for the music. Lord, that uh, we have a great God, an awesome God. You are God and God alone. 
and we praise you. We, we take no apology of that. And we stand on the truth of the Scripture that there is but one God, and His name is Jesus Christ. And we thank you and we praise you for it. Lord, we thank you for all your blessings this week. We thank you for your protection, your, your care. We thank you for your provisions. We thank you for everything that you've given to us, for your wonderful, marvelous grace that you bestowed upon us, all your favor. And God, thank you today that your mercies were new and fresh every day. And thank you as we walked our path this week. We know that goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. And we praise you for it. Now, precious Spirit of God, we come to that time of your word. We ask for you to give us illumination, understanding of the word today. Help us not to be hearers only, but to take heed to the warning and then to be doers, apply what Jesus gives to us today, that we may be blessed and may have what God has for us. Now, Holy Spirit of God, we certainly depend on your help today. You said you would be our teacher and our guide, and that you would guide us into all truth, and you'd give us understanding. You said you would give us anointing and power from on high. You said that you would bring to remembrance the things that Jesus has said to us. So, Father, we rely on that even more so now than ever. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory for it. And, Father, save souls today for Jesus' sake. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. There are seven churches which received seven letters. Seven letters to seven churches, notice, from Jesus. Remember, we learned last week that this is the fourth book of the New Testament that's written in red. Hello? Okay? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, and Revelation is the fifth of the 27 books of the New Testament that is written in red. Other than we have some quotes in the book of Acts, it's about 24 verses that are quoted in the book of Acts, of the 28 chapters of Acts, of the Acts of the Apostles, written by Dr. Luke, uh, quotes some phrases that Jesus said that we have in red, but Jesus wrote this himself. These are personal letters to churches. So I could take, since Laodicea and Age covers from the year 1900 to present tense that we're in. So I have a letter from Jesus to the pastor, the angel of the church. Now I'm not an angel, I'm a messenger. Can I get an amen? All right. Or would you prefer I'm an angel? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Thank you, sister. Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's look at three wonderful things that we notice about these churches. But these are direct letters to seven literal churches that existed in John's day. Matter of fact, John pastored the church of Ephesus. Matter of fact, when he left the Isle of Patmos to take these wonderful letters back, he went back to the church of Ephesus, became a prominent leader once again at the church of Ephesus, and died at about 120 years of age. The only one of the apostles that was not martyred. But they tried to kill him. Tried to boil him in oil. So we find that these have personal application to all of us. All seven of these letters, of these seven letters to the churches, have a personal application. Because you see, when Jesus said, I know thy works, in each letter. Now notice he uses the personal pronoun, I. Jesus said, I'm the one that's writing this. And he says, I know your works. I know the works of West Marion Baptist Church. Where you've taken a stand on my word and where you preach the gospel unapologetically and, and without apology and you, you take a stand on the issues and you speak out for Christ and you have a great missions program. You have a great media program. I know your works. Amen. And I would trust he wouldn't come back and say, but nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. And then he would go on to tell us what he has. And then he would remind us at the close of the letter. So we see some have said that they represent the seven different church ages. And I hold to that position. I agree with that. I hold strongly to that, that they do from studying this for years in history, that yes, it does. Matter of fact, the description of the Laodicean church fits the church today perfect, to a perfect T. Exactly. So that's interesting because 2,000 years ago, Jesus knew exactly where we would be today. 
perfect. So that's why, again, we learned last week that we can trust prophecy because it's reliable, the Word of God. So we find that each letter has a similar pattern to it as we go through it. And, of course, they begin with a greeting and accommodation of their good works. You can read each letter. He starts off, and I know your works. And he begins to commend them for some of the good work that they were doing. Then he comes back and says, except for the church of Smyrna and the Philadelphia church, but I've got something against you. Now, church, let me tell you something. I don't want Jesus to have anything against me. I don't want a desire for Jesus to have anything against this church. Pastor, my angel, my messenger of the church, I know your works. But, nevertheless, definitely do not want to hear that. So we find that there is a condemnation of their sin. See, Jesus never condones sin. He never goes along with sin. He never approves of sin. He never tolerates sin. Because it was that very sin that put him on the cross. So why would he be in agreement with it? Why would he condone it? Why would he approve it? Why would he go along with it when that was the very sin that he died for that put him on the cross? Now he loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. Matter of fact, he says he hates sin. He wants you and I to hate sin. Now there's a place in the scripture where we can hate. That's why Jesus said, love your enemy, Amen. not hate them. That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. Remember, you have heard it said, hate thy enemy. And I tell you, love your enemy. Do good to them. Bless them. But he never approved and condoned the sin. He always reproved it and rebuked it. And he did it with firmness. And he did it with love. And he did it with compassion. We have so many examples of that. In the scripture, the woman at the well came to worship. And Jesus asked her, woman, where is thy husband? She says, I have none, Lord. She answered right. He said, thou hast said well. He agreed with her. She told the truth. He said, no, but you've had five. Past tense. Oh, and by the way, young lady, the one you're living with is not your husband. See, he called out her sin, but he never condemned her of her sin. And they went on about worship, and he told her who it was. She went back into the town and says, come and see. A man that told me all about me. Is this not the Christ? The multitudes that said many believed on him that day and got saved. There was another woman caught in the act of adultery. And the men brought her before Jesus and said, The law demands that she be stoned and put to death. And that was the law. They had every right to do that. But Jesus didn't say, Well, go ahead, man. I, know, I agree with you. I'm with you 100%. That's the law. Take her out. No, he went over and he began to pit right in the sand. And then he picked up a stone. And he said, okay, fellas, ye who are without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone. And one by one they began to drop their stones and leave till all that crowd was gone. And Jesus looked at her. And he said, woman, where are thine accusers? I have none, Lord. Then neither do I condemn thee. But don't stop there. Go and sin no more. So in this letter, he has this condemnation of our sin. And we've all sinned, church, and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. 
There's none that doeth good. We've all gone out of our way and become unprofitable servants. The soul that sinneth it shall surely die. When sin is finished, it will bring forth death. And the wages of that sin is death. Sin will cost you. It's kind of like the old Fram oil filter. Remember the old Fram oil filters, Doug? Mechanic out there? Pay me now, $1.98. Or pay me later, and it shows a mechanic pulling the engine out and a bill about $600. Now, if we made that commercial today, it would be pay me now for this 995 filter or pay me $1,500 to fix your engine. Either way, it's going to cost you. So we find that each one of these churches has this common condemnation of sin except for the two. The church of Smyrna did not, nor the church of Philadelphia. Then there's a challenge or there is a warning given. You see, that's why he said when he closes each letter out, to him that hath an ear, let him hear. See, there's the hearing, what the Spirit has to say, here's the heed, the warning. To each church. So we need to hear and we need to take heed to the warning. And then he says there is an overcomer's reward. There were 19, I think if you count them up, sometimes you can go to 21 if you want to try, but there's definitely 19 rewards that are given to the overcomer. But remember now, the overcomer, the word, is a present participle. That means a continual repeated action. You see, there's the warning. Take heed. We're to continually, presently, continue repeatedly overcoming. Overcoming the world, the things of the world, the ways of the world, the sin of the world, the evil of the world, the wicked one, uh, the, the lifestyle, everything. We're to overcome sin, the power and dominion of sin. And you can't say, well, I can't do that. Yes, we can. If you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, then greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And God has given us the power and the ability to overcome these things. The question is, is are we? And remember, this was to each church. So we're going to look at, and like I said, I'm just following which, what you got. So let's look real quickly at them. You have them there on your outlines if you don't see that. Notice the first one. Let's see the seven churches. Amen? There they are. The church of Ephesus was the first one. Here was their, here was their characteristic. They had left their first love. They had fallen in love with Jesus. You remember when you got saved? How, how much you were in love with Jesus? Remember how you were on fire for God? You couldn't keep you out of church? Oh, you were there every time the doors were open. I don't care if they're having a volleyball game. You were there. Because you couldn't have. You remember how you used to go up to your pastor and you'd tell him, man, uh, and you'd say, give me this. I want to go try. And you were willing to charge hell with a squirt gun. Hey, somebody said that's right. They know what I'm talking about. And you were a soul winner on fire for God and couldn't help telling somebody. You couldn't help God when you got saved as an 11-year-old little girl to tell the audience the other night in our fellowship hall, fall down on the floor. I thought she'd got slain in the Holy Ghost. I wasn't sure what had happened. And she just, I'm just so thankful I got saved tonight. I hope she keeps that zeal. Because, see, she's in love with Jesus. But Ephesus had lost their first love. And Jesus said, return to your first love and repent. Every church is told to repent, the five of the seven. Repent, repent, or else I will do this. And Jesus said, if Ephesus didn't return to their first love and repent, he said, I will come and remove your candlestick. And you know what? There's no church there today, and God did exactly what he said. Go study it. Smyrna was the suffering or the persecution church. They had no commendation against them. Polycarp was the pastor that they talked, but uh, he had to testify to the fact that of his faith in Christ, and they literally tore the man apart. Pergama. Oh, they were the church at Satan's throne. And you can read about that. And he had a great comment. And, and, and by the way, they were the church of... of, of then uh, the church of Satan's throne, that church, you know what that church did? Mostly that church tolerated sin. Amen. They put up with it. They went along with it. They agreed with it. They, 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 and, and, and the Lord said, ah, 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 no way. All right? Then there's the church of Thyatira. That was Jezebel's teaching. They tolerated false doctrine and false teaching. 
and allowed that to go on. Then the church of Sardis, they were dead. Just stone dead. You think you're in a funeral home. I was talking to Brother George last night as we were sitting over there with Mom and we were talking about the music for today. And, and he was talking about how we, we were talking about the choir music and our hymnal congregation music, music. And we try to have a little combination here. The church sometimes sings the old songs. And they sing some of the old songs that have been rearranged and a little more modern. And we have some, a few of the light, light contemporary. I'm a light contemporary guy, okay? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I love and, and I said, but we're, the hymnals. And we were talking about, yeah, George, yeah, I love the, all the old songs and the old hymns. And I said, yeah, I do too. And, and I said, but at the same time, I said, we don't want funeral music. Right, we're not dead. Amen. We serve a risen Savior. Amen. He's in the world today. He's alive and well. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Amen. We don't want dead music around here. I said, this isn't a funeral home. We may be getting ready to have one here, and that's okay, but it's going to be lively too. Amen. Told Mama we're going to have music coming out of her casket. I'll fly away, oh glory. Amen. Amen. She's going to fly away. Of course, she won't be there. That's just her body laying there. She's already with the Lord. Amen. And George said, yeah, man, we don't want to go to sleep. I don't want to go to sleep with the music, man. Don't put me to sleep. This isn't time to go to sleep. This time to get excited. This time to get pumped up about the Word of God and the things of God. We go to sleep tonight when you go to bed. Then you can put on old Moody's night sounds like I used to do in college up at Baptist Bible College in Springfield and listen to Moody night sounds. Mike Kellogg. And his program would either come on or go off the air. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. Can't beat that song. We were talking this week about the Word of God and how the Word of God is rich and how it's a healing in the Scripture and one has to get their mind, this mind in Christ which is in you. And to get the mind of Christ, you've got to get into the Word and let the Word renew your mind. And I was telling her we need to sing the song, There is a Bomb in Gilead. There is a bomb in Gilead. Heals the sin, sick soul. Can't beat them. So we find that. So then there's the dead church. They had a little commendation about them, but not much. But he still gave them one. Philadelphia, the faithful church, had no condemnation. They were faithful to the Lord and the work of the Lord. And, and that was during the 1800s. It started about 1790 and went through to 1900, about 1906. And William Carey, he started the great mission movement of missions. And, and a multitude of souls were won for Christ. And I mean, it's just a fantastic uh, era of time. And then came the Laodicean church. The Laodicean church, the lukewarm church. You know what the word Luke, uh, Laodicean means? It means the rule or the will of the people. That's the modern church today. It's the rule and the will of the people. It means one with great wealth and riches and doesn't need God. Because that's what it says. They have everything and have need of nothing. And Jesus said, oh, but I want to tell you something. You're naked. You're blind. You see Oh, you know what else the word means? It means a people pleaser rather than a God pleaser. Amen. That's what the church today does is try to please the people rather than to please the Lord Jesus Christ. So it really depicts what we are. So there's the challenge of Ephesus. Let's take a look and just follow along. Then we're going to move along in this, all right? Notice the D there in your study guides with me this morning. And we're looking at the Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. We're just going to read this first church just to get an idea of what's going on. And unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, unto the messenger. That's the word angel there means messenger or pastor because he starts off in chapter 1. And John says, I saw seven stars in his right hand and seven golden candlesticks. And he was in the midst of the candlesticks. And it tells us what the stars were and the candlesticks were the seven churches and the seven stars were the seven angels or messengers, the seven pastors of the church. That's Revelation chapter 1. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. Okay? So he says, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, and that could be at that time, that could have been the apostle Timothy or young Timothy. 
He was pastoring Ephesus. Paul started the church for three years and worked it and then called Timothy to be the pastor. John may have been at that time or so forth. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Holds the seven pastors, all right? The angels, the messengers. Who walk in the midst of the seven golden stand. That's Christ walks in the midst of the church. I want to tell you something. He's walking in the midst of the church today. I know thy works. Now every letter started out this way, okay? So we're not going to go through all of them. And thy labor, your work, and thy patience. And thou hast cannot bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles. See, they tried the fake and phony apostles, which they are not, and found them out to be liars. And has borne and has patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. They were going strong for Christ. They were on fire for the Lord. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. That's all he said. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and do what, church? Repent, and do the first works, or else I will come to thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Now there was the hearing, and there was the heed. You'd better heed the warning, because if you don't repent, I'm going to remove you. And guess what? He removed Ephesus. It became a ghost town. A barren waste church land. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nickelodeons, which I also hate. Now here we go. He that hath an ear. Everybody got an ear this morning? Touch your ear and say, I got two of them. Let him hear, take heed, what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Interesting, it's a letter to one church, but he says unto the churches. Here it is. To him that overcometh, here was their reward. I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. How many of you want to eat from the tree of life in the midst of the paradise? Then you've got to be an overcomer. The reward is to the overcomer. You better hear. You better take ear. Heed. If you're not overcoming, this isn't for you. So let's take a look at it. We'll look at this church for a little bit, and we're going to move on. There was once life there, was once vitality. This is the church of Ephesus. There, was, there once was life. There once was vitality. There, are great, there were great investments in the kingdom without growing weary. Man, don't grow weary today, church. Church, let us not become a church that loses our light, that loses our vitality, that loses our steam. Let's not grow weary in doing well for the Lord. Let's not lose sight of missions and the media ministry to reach our world for Christ. Let's keep going strong till Jesus comes. Because I don't know about you, I'd like to walk down the streets of glory and eat from the tree of life in paradise. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm going to be there, but I'd like to eat from the tree. Now look what he says. But you have lost your first love. Church, have you lost your love for Christ today? Have you lost your zeal and drive for the things of God and for the church and the kingdom of God? Folks, we're working for the kingdom. You're kingdom kids. We're trying to advance the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God by winning souls, reaching people with the gospel. And the Lord added daily to the church such as were saved. Let's not lose it. Because notice what he said. Remember, repent. And then do what? Then do. There's the application. See, if this applies to you, and like I said, we don't have time to go through every church like this because we would be really three or four weeks just at Ephesus. And then we'd go to the next one and the next one, and we'd be here a long time. I'm just using this one as a starter so you see this is what goes to almost every one of the church. They all have something together. Only two of them, the only thing were different, and that was they didn't get a reprimand. Smyrna and Philadelphia. The rest are all identical. So we're going to focus on the overcomer for the few minutes we have remaining. What is an overcomer? I, one who is walking in victory and conquering by faith in the conqueror. Who's the conqueror? 
Jesus. See, the one who overcomes is the one who is walking in faith and overcoming in faith in the conqueror, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an overcomer. So let's look at it. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Here it is. I have overcome the world. Now, Jesus wouldn't have told those men to be of good cheer if they couldn't overcome. Come on now. So now, if Jesus can overcome, who else can overcome? 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. Year of God, little children. Say, that's me. How many of you are God today? You saved today? You born again today? Amen. Now, you see, before you say amen, don't say, if I ask you, are you an overcomer? Don't holler out and say amen unless you're overcoming. And that's an everyday process. That's everyday work. You're of God, little children, and have overcome them. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You can be an overcomer today because Jesus is in you. The question is, again, are you overcoming? Because we overcome by our faith as we walk in faith with the conqueror, the Lord Jesus. 1 John 5, 4 and 5. For whosoever is born of God, talk to me, overcometh the world. Now, who's those that are born of God? That means somebody that's saved. You've been born again by the Spirit of God from above. Then you see what it says? You can overcome the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. What is? Even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth. That Jesus is the Son of God. Doesn't get any better than Scripture, does it, church? Colossians 1, 12 and 13. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. See, that's why you can overcome because he has delivered you from the power of darkness. You can't overcome. And Jesus told every church, listen up, take heed. If you want what I got to give you, you'd better be an overcomer. Now, I'm an overcomer as far as qualifying because I have been born again by the Spirit of God from above. That makes me, gives me the title of an overcomer. Then the Bible says I'm an overcomer if I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That qualifies me to give me the title of an overcomer. Then the next question is, is whether I am or not. See, there's the doing of it. Overcoming. All right, let's look at what it says here. 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 10. By the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, because I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. You see, if you've got the grace of God with you, you can be an overcomer. But it's a choice you have to make. Jesus said, hey, to him that overcometh, I'll give you this. But if you don't overcome, you don't get the prize. Amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, 12 and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. Now notice what Paul did not say. Come on, talk to me. He did not say work for your salvation. Are you, are you catching the language here? He said, work it out. In other words, you've already got it. And you didn't get it by works. Okay? You work it out with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, what is the will of God for you and I, his good pleasure? To be an overcomer. To be an overcomer. If it wasn't important, Jesus wouldn't have wrote it seven times to seven churches. And it's interesting, that's how he closed out the letter because that was the last thought he wanted them to know. Okay, you with me? Say me or oh me. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph. Do what? He causes us what? To triumph, church. Not to be defeated, but to triumph, he says. In Christ 
and maketh manifest the savor. Okay, that's a sweet smelling odor uh, of his knowledge by us in every place. God wants us to be a sweet smelling savor in every place we go and we can because we have the power of God, the presence of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit living within us and we can be more than conquerors. Paul said, yea, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. I would love to hear Jesus preach to these seven churches. All right, so let's look at some of the rewards real quickly. Our seven minutes we have left. The overcomer's reward. First of all, number one, these are the seven churches, all right? So if you want to write out next to one, two, and three, write down Ephesus. Here it goes. The first one, the overcomer, will eat of the tree of life in paradise. Look what he says. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, if you want to eat out of the tree of the paradise of God, you've got to be an overcomer. You say, I can't do it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Number two, the Smyrna church, the church of Smyrna. The overcomer will receive the crown of life. There's your crown. And not be hurt by the second death. See, folks, if you're born twice, listen to me, you're only going to die once. But if you're born once, you're going to die twice. So those of us that have been born twice, the second, see, that's the second, the second death ain't going to have no effect on us. Praise God. And then to receive the crown of life. For serving the Lord and, 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 and going under persecution and holding up under it and bearing up under it. And then some may be martyred for Christ. You'll receive the crown of life. Wow. All right, and we read that. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried and shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. In other words, Jesus said to them guys, you'd better get born again. You'd better have two birthdays. Nicodemus, you got to get born again. How can I do that when I'm old? Can I enter into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, No. That which is born of water is water. That's the flesh. But that which is born of the Spirit, that's the Spirit of God from above. That is Spirit. Marvel not. I say unto you, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Three times Jesus told him that. By the way, Nicodemus did get born again. So we praise God for that. Number three, the church of Pergamos. The overcomer will receive the hidden manna and get a white stone with a name that is particular to each of us. To him that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone. And in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Hallelujah. Amen. I'll take the eating of the hidden manna, but give me the stone. Now you think about that for a minute. I wish I had more time to go through all this, but I don't. Just think about it. You earn, overcome, and get this white stone that God's going to give to you. Now, we've already made arrangements with the, Philip, with, the, with the sewing crew, the tailors in glory, especially for the men. We have to have pockets in our white robes of righteousness because we always got to put things in our pockets. Change, you name it, pocket knives, you know, whatever. See? And if you overcome and get this white stone, that's strictly given to you. And you're going to have that thing to those that get it. And you're going to be walking up and down glory. Here's George. He's flipping that thing up in there. Put back in my pocket. Rubs it a little bit, you know, so it shines. Pulls it out again. And here comes Brother Bill. Now I love him, but he didn't get one. 
Hey, what you got there, George? Nothing. Well, I see you flipping something up. What you got, George? Nothing. No big deal. It's nothing. No, come on now. You got something. You can't, there's nothing to keep you from heaven here. We're all in heaven. You can't keep it. What is it? And George says, ah, oh, it's just nothing. It's just got something written on it. And Bill says, well, let me see it. What's it say? Well, I can't tell you. Well, come on now. This is heaven, brother. I can't tell you. Why can't you tell me? Because here, listen up, Bill. It's a secret. What do you mean it's a secret? There's no secrets here in heaven. It's a secret. What's written on it is between me and God only. Amen. For all eternity. That's what it says. Just see, you're going to get a secret from God for all eternity. But Brother Bill did want one. Okay, don't leave him out. Amen? The fourth church, Thyatira. The overcomer will be given authority over the nations and will receive the morning star. You're going to rule over the nations. That's why this morning, Sunday school, be faithful over the least, and God will make us ruler over many. Hello? But just think of that. You're going to get to rule over nations. George is going to take Russia. Bill's taking Iran. Ted's taking Iraq. I'm going to take Hawaii. Yeah, let's have, some, let's have a big pig barbecue tonight out on the ocean here. Amen. Hey, how's it going over there in Iraq and then Baghdad and all that? Man, it's hot. It's desert. Ah, oh, sorry, guys. I got Hawaii. Amen. But hey, guess what? Receive the morning star. You want to know who the morning star is? Go back to Revelation to the end. And Jesus said that he is the morning star. That speaks of the ever presence of Christ in your life. Sardis, the overcomer, will be dressed in white. Watch this. And will not blot out his name out of the book of life. And will acknowledge his name before the Father. I don't have time to go into all that. I'm just telling you, if you want to be dressed in white and you don't want your name blocked out, you better be an overcomer. Okay? He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. The Philadelphia church. The overcomer will be made a pillar in the temple of God. And it says you'll go out no more. Just think of that. You're going to be the strength that supports the temple of God in glory. Wow. With the names of God, you're going to have the names of God written on you. You're going to have the name of God's city written on you. You're going to have the name of the new Jerusalem on you. And now guess what else? And God's going to give you a new name. Wow. That's why we sing the song. I got a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. It's mine. All mine. To the overcomer. So I don't know what your name will be. And then came the Laodicean church. The overcomer will be given the right to sit with Jesus on his throne. Isn't that interesting? They get the best reward. Listen to what he says in Revelation 3.21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. You see, we got a whole lot more to overcome in this church age that we live in. So those that do have a greater reward. Can you imagine getting to sit next to Jesus on the throne? Next to God the Father, next to Him? Because you were an overcomer? Jesus again reminds all the churches, he that hath an ear, church, let him hear. Take heed what the Spirit saith unto the churches. 
Revelation 3.22. And then he backed up in verse 20. And he says to all these churches, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door. Notice, you got to open the door. Amen. Did you ever notice when you see that painting of Jesus standing and knocking on the door, there's no doorknob on the outside? It's on the inside. And by the way, what he's doing here, I know people, we like to use this verse in soul winning. Nothing wrong with it. But in the content and context, Jesus is standing on the outside of the door of this church this morning. And he's knocking. And he says, I want to come in and have fellowship with you. Or I desire that. But you, church, have got to open the door. And if you will, I will come in and fellowship with you and you with me. Revelation 3.20. Now Jesus wants to have fellowship with you today. He wants to have fellowship with our church. He wants to have fellowship with you today, perhaps if you're not saved. You can't be an overcomer until you first become one. Are you with me? Those of you that are watching by television, listening on the radio and the internet, hanging in here with us, we're about done. You can't be an overcomer. You can't overcome until you become an overcomer. And to be an overcomer, one must be born again by the Spirit of God from above. First John says, and that makes you an overcomer. Then it says you must be one that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That qualifies you and gives you the title overcomer. Then you've got to put it to work. Then you can start overcoming. But you can't overcome all this that Jesus talked about until you know Jesus. And to him to know is to know is to know life and to know it everlasting life. If you've never been saved or born again this morning, we're going to give you that opportunity to do so today. You need to become an overcomer. If you're not saved, you need to get that title. And then you need to go to work. And those of us that are here and saved, you have the title because you've been born again by the Spirit of God from above. Can I get an amen for all those that are saved? Amen. amen. You've confessed and believed. To how many of you here this morning confessed and believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Can I get an amen? amen. Then you have the title as an overcomer. Now the question is, as he gave seven letters to seven churches, to him that overcometh. See, there's an overcomer, then there's the overcometh. That's the present participle. Then I will give you all these things. Nineteen of them. You can get them all if you're an overcomer. The question is, is are you overcoming today? That's to the believer. If you're here today and watching by television and you're not an overcomer, then we beg you today, we encourage you today to become an overcomer. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me talk to the television audience for just a minute. Our radio, television, TV, YouTube, all of that. Listen. We want you to become an overcomer today. So you can start overcoming the world, the ways of the world, the evils of the world, everything. So you can have all what God has for you and wants to give to you. But you've got to become an overcomer. You have to be born again by the Spirit of God from above. You must believe and confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's what 1 John said. And we're going to do that right now. We're going to help you. We're going to pray and the prayer is just words. That's communicating with God. But we're going to put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and invite Him in to become our Savior and our Lord and get the title Overcomer. And then we can start overcoming. So we're going to pray right now. Communicate with God. Now remember, it's not the prayer that saves you. It's putting your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone and His finished work, what He did on cross of Calvary for you. So let's pray together. Those in the auditorium as well. You may pray out loud, you may pray silently, whatever, but to our audience there that's watching and listening, pray with me. Dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess with my mouth, You are the Lord from heaven. I confess that I'm a sinner, God, and I've sinned against You. And I ask You to forgive me and to cleanse me. And he will, my friend, he will. 
I do now believe in my heart, that's faith, that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He took my place. He paid my sin debt. I believe that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, the Bible. And so right now by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and receive you into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name and I thank Him for hearing and answering my prayer and giving to me eternal life, everlasting life. And now I am an overcomer. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. We'll trust many of you came to Christ today and invited Jesus in your heart and life. Let us know. Call us. Email us. It's all on the screen there for you. In the meantime, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Cause His face to shine upon you. And remember, God loves you. And so do we. God bless you.